Trusting the Word of God is our theme this morning. And we are thankful that we can do that. Thankful we can do that. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we just do thank You and praise You for this opportunity this morning to hear the Word of God, hear it preached, hear it talked about, hear it uh, expounded. Lord Jesus, we're just thankful for the Word of God and the promises that You have in it. Toward us as believers, toward the, toward the power of the Word of God and how it abounds to us, Lord, how many promises we've got. Lord Jesus, how You've given us very clearly instructions as to how to live, very clearly promises and how to have faith, how to believe God for the big things. And I want to pray this morning, Lord, that each and individual per each individual person that has attended this church this morning, and each person that will hear this sermon, Lord Jesus, will walk away from this with a renewed importance of the Word of God in their life. And so, Jesus, would you just please bless us now? Open up our hearts with your Holy Spirit, Lord Jesus. Let this be a second witness. Let this be something that we've already we already know, Lord Jesus. But it's just a reminder, Lord, that we are. Uh, Start about the Word of God in our lives. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. The title of this sermon is called The Starving Christian because I believe that many people are starving due to their lack of fervor and their lack of hunger for the Word of God. There's an outcry in the world today for malnourished children. But what about malnourished Christians? Maybe if the Christian were not so malnourished, there would not be so many malnourished Christians. The thing about starvation is, <clears throat> thing about starvation is, um, after you go so long, you don't even realize you're hungry. As a matter of fact, your body just kind of shuts that off. It just says, that, you know, you're not hungry. Don't worry about it. Anybody that's ever fasted for a long period of time knows that. After a couple of days, you're just not even hungry. And it stays that way for about 12 days, and then you get hunger pains again. That goes away after about a day, and then after at about past the 20 day mark, you get really, really hungry. And they say that's when medically you're supposed to eat at that point, because that's when your body's starting to attack your internal organs for sustenance. Medically, I believe people people have and do uh, by the miraculous. By miraculous means, by the Spirit of God, fasting much longer than uh, between 20 and 30 days. But the point I'm trying to make is, uh, hungry people don't realize they're hungry, don't realize their body needs food after a certain period of time. And that's much how it is with the uh, Word of God. Of course, we're not talking about food; we're talking about the Word of God. That's how it is with the Word of God. People will get out of the habit of studying their Bible, reading. And I'm, now this morning, I'm talking about studying the Bible. I'm not just talking about reading it. I'm talking about studying it, knowing it, understanding the background for it. You'll notice in any good study Bible, it tells you the author, the date, the background. All of those things are very important, and we ought to understand why they're important. <clears throat> the Bible says to study to show thyself approved unto God. We need to study, not just read, but to study the Word of God. See, the Word of God is nourishment for our souls. I was very clear about that. It's nourishment for our souls, and if our souls are malnourished, we, uh, we begin to lose our relationship with God. We begin to lose our fire and fervor for the Lord. It's the Word of God, and I don't want to get ahead of myself. It's sharper than any two-edged sword. It will pierce us. It will show us. It will guide us. It will direct us. You cannot be a Christian in this day and age apart from the Word of God. Now Thomas Aquinas, or Thomas Aquinas, Thomas Aquinas, actually 13th century around that time, he he made that statement that the atheists uh, that the atheists absolutely love that Christians don't need the Bible in order in order to serve Jesus. Now why would he say that? Now he was a very famous uh, uh, writer and had a lot of many wise things to say. But you can understand the 13th century. Nobody could hardly read, and there wasn't any public Bible to be dispersed. So they were kind of relying upon the church to do that. And I believe as we're getting closer to the end times, the Lord has put the Bible and made it accessible to just about everybody in the world. We're getting close to that. As 
just about in every language, and there's actual mission, actual mission societies out there. Uh, I'm trying to think of that one off the top of my head. Um, with with people, they're here just doing, I mean, they're taking it to the 21st century with satellite imagery and all this other stuff, getting things into uh, these lost tribes and obscure languages and things like that, which people like their... Uh, Everybody, don't want to mention his name, but everybody who smuggled Bibles all over the world into places. I mean, it's it's pretty evident to me that Thomas Aquinas' statement is very much outdated. We don't have any excuse today. I mean, my goodness, if you need a Bible, take one home with you. There's one sitting in just about every pew. I mean, there, there's no excuse for us, especially in the English speaking world. And if you can't read, I understand that. There's audio Bibles out there. I mean, there is, there's no reason for us not to get into the Word of God more often. Really no reason at all. I mean, no reason at all. <clears throat> so, basing on that claim, uh, uh, you know, let's just quickly look at just a few things and hopefully just get committed as a church. I believe our church really needs to be committed to this. And we ought to be single-minded about it. That's what I'm going to aim for this sermon. So, <clears throat> let's begin with this claim that was just made that the Word of God is nourishment for our souls. It's food. It's indisposable. We cannot live without food. Eventually we will die. It will be a slow death, but eventually we will die. So it is with Christianity. If you try to do it apart from the Word of God, apart from your, uh, apart from hungering for it, thirsting for it, being in it, eventually you will die. You cannot get around that. So, Christians are malnourished without the Word of God. After 40 days of fasting, when Satan came and tempted Jesus, he said this famous statement, I'm sure most of you know it, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Matthew chapter 4 and verse 4. That has some wonderful implications to us and some wonderful teachings to us that Jesus said man will not live just on the physical things, just on the physical realm, but this is a very spiritual and living book and it feeds our soul. We must have it. Like I said, this going to be a lot of reminders this morning. We cannot grow without being dedicated to reading the Scriptures. You guys realize that. Now, could Christians grow back in Aquinas' day, 13th century, 14th century? These times they didn't have Bibles made to the public. Of course they could. But you see, my friends, we have light. We have responsibilities. You know, Sodom and Gomorrah was wiped out, wiped off the face of this earth, um, and they didn't even have a Bible. We've got a Bible in every home in America, pretty much. And we neglect that. We cannot grow without being dedicated to reading the Scriptures. In 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 1-3, through 3, Therefore, laying aside all malice, all deceit, hypocrisy, evil, and evil speaking, as newborn babes desire the pure milk of the Word, that you may grow. Desire the pure milk of the Word, so that you may grow. Pure milk. Read it. You know, I may come up here from time to time. Um, rarely ever am I wrong, but I'm just kidding. <clears throat> but from time to time, I may say, say something completely foolish. I've said it before. It was not wise. But see, when you that that's not the pure milk of the word. If you're relying just on sermons alone, sermons should point you to a deeper reality of this. This is not a this is not a grievous thing for the word to read the word of God. This is something that we get pointed to and we grow because it is pure. I may say I'm a mortal man. I make mistakes all the time. I may teach you something wrong. But hey, you can go home and you can study this thing and you can come back as uh, um, my buddy did just a few months ago and he said what you said was scripturally inaccurate. And then, I don't know if you guys remember that service or not, but I came up and apologized and said what I said was scripturally inaccurate. I did not mean it to come out that way. It was you know, it wasn't the right thing to do. And so, I, you know, that's the pure milk of the Word. You cannot rely upon one sermon. Now, I will say this, 99.9% .9 of the time, I believe I'm preaching what's true. I believe that I'm, you know, apart from human frailty, I think that I'm, pre I'm diligent to understand what I'm talking about. I go out and I preach with what I believe is absolutely true in my heart. But if you're relying upon one meal a week to try to survive, You'll go without, it goes without saying, it's not going to happen for you. It's just not going to do it. Even two meals, three meals a week, you've got to feed yourself every single day. And you ought to be coming up with constructive ways to do that. I like to carry a little um, 
carry a little Bible in my vehicle with me, a physical Bible, a physical Bible. I've got one on my phone for when I'm out shopping with my wife or something and she's taking too long, I can go find a quiet place to sit and I can get on the, the New King James Version right on my phone and I can read that. I got that there too. But I got a physical Bible that I keep right in my vehicle all the time. And I never know when I need it. You never know when you get stuck in traffic somewhere. You never know when you might just get pulled to that. You just want to read it a little bit more. We've really got to put, we got to be intentional about this. We've got to grow by that pure milk of the Word. I like how Peter ends this statement. As newborn babes desire the pure milk of the Word, that you may grow thereby, if indeed you may have tasted the Lord is gracious. I want to give you this statement. What you feed will grow. What you feed will grow. If you want to feed distractions in your life, you want to feed entertainment to your life, you want to feed those things, they will grow. They will continue to grow and they'll just keep on expanding. But you've got to have discipline to be able to you know, turn the power, hit the power button, walk away from the computer, put down the cell phone, and just get the Word of God and feed your soul. You feed your soul, your soul will grow. You will grow deeper with God. You will, as the hymn writer will talk about, was talking about, we'll get deeper in the love of Jesus, we'll understand him more. But it is, <clears throat> but I've, it's been my observation that it's most often that people do not feel like they have the time to read scriptures like they should. And this may be true if your life is filled with meaningless pursuits, because it could not be anything more meaningful than dedicating your life to studying the Word of God and knowing it just as much as you can. But, we have the time. That's reality. You say, I don't have time to read my Bible the other day. So you've got time. You're just not using it the right way. And everybody's got time to do stuff. That's not a very good excuse. What you don't have is priorities. Your time gets wasted on frivolous things. Feed your soul, friends. If you want to be tall with God, you're going to have to feed your spirit on a daily basis. It's the truth. I've never, never noticed throughout any Christian I've ever heard that's moved in a mighty way through this kingdom, I've, through God's kingdom, has grew it and done major things. I've never seen a Christian where they said, well, I read my Bible on occasion. You know, it, I mean, it wasn't my biggest priority. No, it was a, every Christian that's ever done anything for God's had two major priorities in their life. One's prayer and the other one's scripture reading. Anything else works itself out in the wash, you know. Which, by the way, I don't have this in this sermon, but I want to go ahead and mention it. I'm not talking about reading Christian books. I'm not talking about that. I'm not talking about now, devotional books. I love them. Biographies. I love them. Christian fiction. The whatever you want to read. You know, all of that's really good. But the Scripture. This is the only living book. We have to dedicate ourselves to reading that upon a daily basis. You lack power in your life. You lack hunger in your life. You lack thirsting for God in your life. You need to put the Word of God in a strong way into your life. Now, secondly, Christians are misguided without the Word of God. Christians are misguided without the Word of God. Scripture says that the Word of God is a light in the darkness. Psalm 119, uh, chapter 119, verse 105, that famous verse, Your Word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. Isn't that the truth? I hope it is in your life. Your Word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. Well, I hope that's true this morning. hope that you don't have any other lamp trying to light your life. I see that quite often as I see upon the, the tones of the social media networks. Which, did you know, by the way, kind of a sidetrack again, that's okay, I like those. Did you know that what the creator of Facebook said the other day? He made a statement. I heard about it in a prayer meeting last time. He said that, in, in, in a paraphrase, he said that, Basically, Facebook is filling the void that the churches have left out. He said that. In other words, he was talking about socialization. He's talking about being social. Uh, it's sad to say that that is most of our social networking anymore. I mean, that was, Facebook's not the first social network. MySpace wasn't either. The first social network was actually getting out and making contact with people. <laughs> face to face, talking to people. Calling up somebody on the phone. Does anybody remember three-way calling? That was a big thing when I was a teenager. Everybody, you called your buddy, and then your buddy would call him on three-way, and you'd sit there and have a group conversation. And 
we'd actually have conversations. It wasn't over, you know, like, I'll get back to this later and go do something else and man. <clears throat> but see, like, when you get on Facebook, you start seeing things and you start questioning things. And I was just talking to G last night, my mother in law, I was talking about, you know, and I had two conversations in the last week that were very similar. The Facebook will just absolutely wear you out. It will wear you out as a Christian. It's just so sad. People absolutely don't have a filter on that. And I've got a, this does relate to what I'm preaching about. Because it's almost a really good social experiment if your mind works that way. Because you can sit there and notice what people really believe. Because they don't have any filter. They put the, I mean, it's whatever, for some reason, people just seem to think that they put whatever they think on there. At least some people believe. I don't think everybody does, but some people do. And it just exposes their heart. I mean, and this is past week. I mean, it was it was kind of grievous to me. A person on there saying that they're a Christian on one side, then on the other side, just in complete support for understanding homosexuality and that it wasn't a sin. So I just plainly posted some scripture on there that refuted that, and they and I said, uh, Christians cannot be Christians apart from believing the Word of God is true. And she said, no, that's only true for people like you. And see, that's that's a good example of somebody taking a different lamp to light their way. And what they're taking is, you know, they're wherever they're being fed this liberal mindset that's going around today, that, you know, we need to accept everybody and love everybody and nobody's going to hell and nobody's, you know, and they're trying to be Christians apart from the Word of God. It's a very misguided way of thinking. But God said, your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. He will show us truth and that we are responsible to uphold that truth. The Word of God will give you direction in your life. <clears throat> your ears shall hear a word behind you saying, this is the way, walk in it. Isaiah 30 and 21. Whenever you turn to the right hand or whenever you turn to the left. We ought to really think about that in a very definite way. As I've been reading, I've read two books lately that said the exact same thing that, it, that, that makes that scripture quite literal. Whenever Lila G. McConnell came and planted that church over there, I can't remember the scripture I thought of it, but when she came and planted Mount Carmel over there, she attached a scripture to it. She attached a scripture to it. Dennis Kenlaw said, Anytime that you get a vision about something, I believe it's Dennis Kenlaw, said anytime you get a vision about something, you need to attach scripture to it. And see, A.W. Tozer said kind of the same thing. He said most often people will spend so much time in prayer trying to hear from the Lord when they should be spending more time in the Word than they will hear from Him. Makes sense, doesn't it? I mean, he's spoken thousands of words into this book. This is God's voice. I mean, it really is. It's a timeless voice. A timeless voice to us today. He will give you direction. And apart from the Word of God, Christians can be misguided. They can be thrown into all kinds of different uh, different doctrines, different theories, different thoughts. And they can, you know, uh, they can be just completely discombobulated when they come up with their uh, they come up with their facts. They would call it. Come up with their worldview. Come up with their way of thinking apart from the Word of God. I'm so thankful that the Lord put me on the path that, that I did, that I was on very early. You know, I've said it before, but it's very applicable to this sermon. I'm so thankful two of the first books that were ever given to me. You know, one was Fresh Wind, Fresh Fire by Jim Simbley. We'll put a third in there. Everybody ought to read that one. But there's a, a big King James Version of the Schofield Study Bible. And by the way, if you ever read the notes of John Schofield, you'll notice that many of them Many of them are weird. He believed in the gap theory, for instance, that there's millions of years in between. You know, he believed in evolution and, and creation all working together and all this other stuff. But somebody also gave me a strong support of this, which is a Greek Hebrew lexicon. It's very basic to anybody that used one, really. But not a person in this room couldn't learn how to use one. They're really simple. And so, when people said something, I honestly and truly just go to the scriptures, go to the concordance. Sit there and figure out what God was saying. By the way, kind of hard to figure out what the Bible is really and truly saying unless you really take it back to the original languages and 
trying to figure out what's going on there in some of these some of these scriptures, like we saw last Wednesday night. It'll change the whole way you view the pastors when you find out some of the Greek uh, Greek things behind them. And the reason that I'm in a church today and preach the things that we do and I believe the things that we're in is because it's all been tested by Scripture and guided by the Holy Spirit. I believe that wholeheartedly. The things that I believe, I'll stand on them and I will defend them until Jesus comes back because they've been tested by Scripture. And I believe wholeheartedly that I've been guided by the Word of God not by other people's opinions. That is one good thing about being a strong young person, I guess. Is when somebody tells you something, you're automatically skeptical until you prove it. Now, the only thing that I know is completely true, which is this right here. <clears throat> I was thinking last night about this, how the Word of God gets us away from darkness. I was meditating upon this, and I was thinking about a lighthouse. Um, don't know much. I didn't know much about lighthouses. Didn't know why they existed and why they were in the places they were until I went last night and started actually researching. Why do they put? Why? Where did they come from? Why? Why do they have them? It was interesting. A lighthouse had really two primary purposes. The first purpose was a lighthouse was put in places that were extremely dangerous for ships to go. You know, they would put them up on a high cliff somewhere to warn people this is a shallow part of the sea. Stay out as far as you can. Don't come in here, you know, in heavily trafficked areas. You will sink. You will destroy your ship if you try to approach the shoreline from this angle. The other purpose of the lighthouse was <clears throat> that they would be able to be visible in a place that was a safe harbor that would bring people in to this, this safe harbor. And, and, and I was thinking about that in context, like, man, no wonder the Lord laying lighthouse upon my, I mean I've heard that before but I've never really thought about why you know, people would use a lighthouse for the word of God but it had, they had two purposes I, didn't, I would have never known that it's amazing when you start I was meditating on that Psalm 119 105 the word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path for there are many sailors that have their lives have been saved because they looked to the lighthouse in the darkness <clears throat> they can see the lighthouse off in the distance just before it does get they can see that light going and see the harbor and all the other ships over there and say this is a safe entrance to that harbor. And that's just exactly what our, uh, the Word of God is today for us. That it points us into the safe arms of Jesus. It points us, it keeps us away from danger. If we would just make up our minds to obey the Word of God, we would keep ourselves from many, many hardships. Furthermore, and, or, and thirdly, here we got... Christians are sanctified, are not sanctified, apart from the Word of God. Jesus said this in a very general sense. We are sanctified by the Word. He said, sanctify them by the truth. By your truth, your Word is truth. While that is true, I believe it's the, uh, we believe uh, here in this church, or at least I believe, you're not obligated to believe this, but I believe it wholeheartedly, I believe the Bible teaches it. Um, but when you're baptized with the Holy Spirit, you're a sanctified holy. Because I don't see how hardly it's possible that you could uh, be emptied of yourself and filled with the Holy Spirit and not be made complete in Jesus Christ. That just makes sense to me. So I believe that wholeheartedly. <clears throat> but that being said, that's not what this sermon's about. If you want to put yourself on a fast track for that kind of blessing, make up your mind right now and just obey the Word of God. Really. Just sit down and say, hey, you know, if, we're, if the Word of God says it, I'm just going to do it. God commands it. I'm just going to do it. And, uh, you know, whether if it's by sanctification, uh, we receive it, uh, whether it is the sanctification we receive when we're saved, or the sanctification that we receive when we are filled with the Spirit, either of them is by faith. And we must follow that pattern as we look at the commands of the Bible that says, um, so that faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. I mean, that's how you get faith in things like that. I would have never believed that in, in what people would call second blessing holiness or entire sanctification if I wasn't in prayer on my knees one night reading through that blessed epistle of 1 Thessalonians and ran across 5.23 and 24 myself that says very clearly, I'll turn it over here, I don't have it in my notes, but it was finally... Uh, Finally, the Word of God 
They convinced me of this. And it said, Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely. May your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Well, that pretty much settles it, don't it? Something that happens before you go to heaven. It's something that's a complete sanctification. I knew what sanctification meant. That means you're being separated and made pure. People had always told me that, you know, that you're, you know, that's going to be an ongoing process until you until you uh, until you go on into glory. Well it is. But there's also a complete work that needs to be done. And the word of God tells us about it. There's also, I love in the back of my Bible, there's uh, 30, it shows you 30. 30 more or 29 more scriptures that tell you the same exact thing. And then when you get into uh, some uh, real studies and get into some Greek word studies and things like that, you can find hundreds more. Hundreds more that tell you the same thing. See, we can't be convinced of doctrine apart from the Word of God. The Word of God is our very first and foremost uh, test for all things. And we must use it as such. Many people want a maximum blessing on minimum deposits. They want that fervent life in God. They want more of Jesus in their life. And, and listen, guys, that's not by thirst, that's not by feelings and emotions or anything. Listen, it goes back to that what you feed will grow. You want your life to be more Christ-like? You want there to be more of Jesus in there? Then get more into the Word of God. You spend a few hours in the Word uh, one day, to set, set aside one day a week to just do nothing but sit with the Bible open and pray through some scriptures. Oh my goodness. When I want wisdom, you know what I do? I decide this week I'm going to do all my devotions in Proverbs. And that's been going on for a couple weeks. I mean, it's all in there. It can meet every day. We just need to turn to it. We need to use it. John 17, 17, as we were just talking about before, tells us that God's Word is truth. We can't know truth apart from God's Word. Psalm 119 and 160 says, The entirety of your word is truth, and every one of your righteous judgments endures forever. <clears throat> I like how this uh, truth today is being defined by Webster. There's about three different definitions on there. There's one you can tell has been inserted in the latter part of this century, I think. The latter part of the last century into this century. It says, A judgment proposition or idea that is true or accepted as true. It kind of leaves the door wide open to say it's like, well, if you accept it, then it is true. Well, I thank God that His Word is not something, whether we accept it or not, it's still true. That's why it's a solid rock. We can stand upon it. It doesn't matter what the whole rest of the world says. We can stand right upon it. Jesus said in John 8, 31, 32, it says, Then Jesus said to those Jews who believed Him, if you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. It's not by emotions, not by feelings, not by any sort of thing. It is the truth. It's God's word. It is true. And uh, they will, and it will absolutely set you free. But here's the thing. You have to accept it as truth. And that is a deep and abiding sense of, of need coupled by looking at God's word and, and by faith accepting that what you may believe is, is probably wrong and that what God's Word is saying is absolutely true and we should test everything through that kind of filter. Truth, in other words, doesn't matter about emotions or feelings. It's just truth. Just as soon as we all accept God's Word for the standard of truth in our life, we will be free. True faith, trust beyond our feelings. Truth sets us free whether the feelings are there or not. Amen listening to a good holiness sermon uh, this past week. I can't remember the guy's name exactly. I wish I could drop his name, but I can't. It's a good message anyway. And he was talking about how he was doing some mission work over in uh, Japan. He was teaching in, a, teaching in a seminary and doing some meetings uh, over there. And he said there's a tent meeting where there was a little Korean boy that was sitting out there. And he heard about, uh, heard about the truth of holiness and things like that. Never heard anything like that. And he said, I would like to start coming to your classes. He said that little boy would sit there and he was real stoic and, and real, uh, had that, he said he described it as that kind of Asian look where people would just kind of look at you. You don't know what they're thinking. They're just kind of looking at you. You know, there, there's no emotion or no anything going on in this guy. 
You know, a little backstory on this little Korean fella. First of all, he was in he was a Korean fella and he was in Japan. And Japanese and Koreans had a little bit of animosity going on. He was staying with a Japanese pastor and he felt this real tinge going on at home. Every day when he come home, he would feel this kind of awkwardness that was that was going on there. So as he was <clears throat> sitting there in the class one day, he finally stood up and came to the professor, the fellow that was preaching this message. He said, uh, he said, I want to tell you how much freedom your blessings have been given me. He said, I started uh, <clears throat> he said, I started really praying the other night about the second blessing that you were talking about, teaching about. And he said, uh, <clears throat> he said, I didn't feel any emotion. I didn't feel anything, but I, I just settled it by faith. I said, Lord, I'm just going to obey every single word that you have for me. He said, it meant that I'd have to give up my uh, current course of action and become a minister and, and give up things. Probably disappoint my family a little bit. It didn't really matter to me though. You know, so I just really want to do want to settle with the Lord. <clears throat> he said, so as I sat there and I prayed and he said, Satan kept buffing me and he said, and he said, I kept waiting for an emotional bliss to overcome me and he said, I just really wanted that feeling that, that God had filled me. I felt like there should be a feeling. And he said, as Satan came, you know, came harder and harder, and he said, you know what, Satan? And he said, I finally told the devil, you know what? <clears throat> uh, doesn't really matter what you say, because tonight I fixed my faith on obeying all of the will of God. So it really doesn't matter what you say to me. That's that still leaps and bounds more than what I was doing before. So it's obvious that was what the fruit of this blessing is. So that's what I'm going to do, and I'm going to take it by faith. And he said, as I walked home, I felt like I needed to go home and confess the animosity I'd kind of been kind of going on in the home and just confront that. And he said, uh, he opened up the door and his, uh, was met by the, the minister's wife. And he said, I have a confession. I am different now. And he was quickly interrupted by the pastor's wife and said, and she said, I know. I can see it all over your face. <laughs> and I said, well, praise the Lord. We do not have to have any feelings um, to accompany truth. We just really need to set our hearts to accepting it. If God's Word says it, I'm going to believe it and go on. <clears throat> I'm going to believe it and go on. You know, the Lord's blessing every single one of you, every single day of your life. You understand that, don't you? As soon as you understand that, you can accept that by faith. You can go to and pray these little prayers of thanksgiving that I've wonderfully found out in my own Christian experience that through these prayers of thanksgiving, the, let, the devil will soon let loose of you and let you go and let you live in the liberty that the Bible promises us. Because he, I'll tell you what, Satan don't like me in the same room where somebody's just fix their mind on thanking God all day. And as soon as we just start doing that, as soon as we start seeing the blessings, the people will live in freedom, my friends, because it's truth. And the truth will set us free. Christians do not know the depths of God apart from God's Word. Romans 11 33 says, Oh, the depths of the riches of the wisdom and the knowledge of God. How unsearchable are His judgments. His ways are past finding out. And we will never know all the depths of God either, my friends, because John 21 25 he ends that glorious gospel with, and there's so many things that Jesus did, which if they were written one by one, I suppose that even the world itself could not retain the books that were written that would be written. Amen. Well, isn't that true? And isn't that wonderful? That one of these days, when we do have God's revelation to man, we can know the depths of God and God's revelation to man here. Isn't it wonderful? We can look forward to an eternity. Even though the libraries of this world may not be able to fill it up, eternity will be filled up with truth. And we'll get to hear it right out of our Savior's mouth. He can tell us story after story of the things that were not written in His Word, truth after truth, things that were not written in His Word that we probably couldn't even be able to handle it. Our little heads would explode because God is so far past finding out. But we can know the depths of God. We can know His depths. Just as much as He's revealed us, just as much as we can handle, He, can, he will give us His depths if we will set ourselves to finding out what God's Word has to say about it. I believe God wants to make Himself known to us. There are four things I learned in one of my classes that God... That it is a good little list and reminder. He wants to, that God's Word shows us, by the way, God's dealings with man is one of them. That's what God's Word will plainly show us. God's message to man is found in this book. Man's experience of God is found in this book. And the revelation 
of God's Son, Jesus Christ, is found in this book. Now, between those four things, you won't need much else in your life. You really won't. That'll answer everything. That'll take care of everything. If you'll let it, if you'll take it by faith that that is what you need, if you'll let it take hold, then uh, God will bless you with it. It will satisfy your soul. I know that any time my soul needs satisfied, I want to pick up the Word of God and uh, read it for a while. My soul is satisfied. My eyes are set on Jesus. I'm just astounded over and over again by the wisdom of God. And I oftentimes take it for granted. I don't think I preach about it nearly enough, about the daily life of Bill that this sits and is blessed by the Word of God on a daily basis. I honestly, it's like I, there was a boy who wanted me to mentor him over the summer and keep him accountable to some things. First thing I told him, I said, I wouldn't leave your house in the morning or make human contact, if humanly possible, without spending some time in the Word of God every single day of your life. He said, Oftentimes I do my, my devotions at night. And I said, oftentimes you've also told me that your spiritual life is up and down and up and down, left and right, left and right. I said, I can guarantee you, brother, if you would just set your mind with getting in the Word of God if you leave the house in the morning, it would make the whole rest of your day smooth out in a way that you never knew. That you, he said, I mean, my life will be easy and good. And, and I said, no, your life will be satisfying and you'll have your eyes fixed on truth. You will know that you have spoken with God this morning and He has spoken to you. Sure enough, He put that into practice a couple of weeks ago. He's been living in victory ever since. He was a sanctified believer and never thought that, that would make that much of a difference. And then lo and behold, it did. Huh. Well, how about that? <clears throat> testimony after testimony written in books out there in our, in our library of other Christians have done the same exact thing. What does it cost you waking up a half hour early? That's all it is. Can you imagine? Talking to God every morning, you can do that. You wake up a half hour early. That revelation of Jesus is what we need. We really need a fresh, a refreshing in the church today of the majesty of God, of the glory of God. You can find that out. There's five books within the 66 books that we call the Bible: Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. The revelation. You know, if you ever want to really, really see Jesus, really see what, see every aspect of Him, and what all He has to say personally. Then you can get on there and get in there and find those red letters and those Bibles. You can get a fresh revelation of Him. You don't have to. It don't have to be a mystery. God didn't. He, he never wanted to be a mystery. He wanted to reveal Himself. He wanted to reveal Himself. That's why He sent us His Son. John 1 14 or John chapter one verse one says, "In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God." Today we have the Word here. We don't believe that this is God. We believe this is God's revelation to man. But we have the, if Jesus, one of his uh, names for his deity was the Word, don't you think this book would be a little important? <laughs> and don't you think this would be God's revelation to us? And that's what that is referring to. As it says in John 1 and verse 14, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. You'll find that out from passage to passage and from Scripture to Scripture, from book to book, that this book is filled with grace and truth and you can understand and know the depths of God just alone with this book. But sometimes I, I like to read commentaries. And sometimes I like to figure out what some of these other uh, great thinkers and writers and, and revivalists of the faith like to, like to uh, say. Matthew Henry's one of them. W.B. Godby's one of them. Adam... Clark, uh, sometimes even Jameson, or is it Jameson, Fawcett, and Brown, you know, um, don't really agree with everybody's theology, but I do like to hear what other people think. I don't think God's limited to speaking to one school of theology. I think he, that people might have differing opinions on things, but God can truly speak to us. I do like what Matthew Henry said about uh, this, this passage in John here where it says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. The Word was God. Matthew Henry wrote in his commentary, the plainest reason why the Son of God is called the Word seems to be that as our words explained our mind to others, so was the Son of God sent in order to reveal His Father's mind to the world. That's absolute, I believe that's absolutely true. I believe that's a pretty accurate interpretation. See, when a king beckons somebody in his presence, he will send word to that person. So as the Father sent the Son so that we may be beckoned into His presence. How, lean, how little premium 
is put on this today. You know, we like to have prayer meetings in this church. I wonder what it'd be like if we had a Bible meeting all the time. Now, we should have a Bible meeting all the time. But what if we just came in here? I wonder how many people would come. You always get low numbers at a prayer meeting. It's usually the lowest attended service in the church. But I bet, I bet it would be even lower. I hate to say it. I'm trying to be negative. I'm just thinking it would be even lower if we just said, today, all we're going to do this Friday night, <clears throat> we're going to come here at 6.30, and we're just going to read the Bible for an hour and a half. Now, I wonder how many people would actually come to that. Or if you had that, not point a finger to anybody in the air. That sounds reasonable. You know, I know a church, I, I'm not pointing at any fingers from this church. I'm, I was thinking more of a community context. I wonder how many people from the community just want to come together and read the Word of God out loud. Now, we have a little Bible reading every year out here, and there's been 40 different churches come and do things like that. It's been absolutely wonderful. But I wonder on a weekly basis, no special event, <clears throat> no PA system projecting it out on the streets, just if we came in here, just to honor the Lord. I wonder how many people come. I don't think there's a very big premium upon the Word of God and its power today being taught in the church. But I believe if our church would set our mind to just reading the Word and studying it, maybe even unifying together and studying the same things once, you know, from week to week in our personal devotional time, I wonder how much it would transform us. Christians are unequipped to stand against evil apart from the Word of God. Ephesians chapter 6 and 17. It says it is our weapon against the enemy, the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Remember the enemy came toward Jesus in the wilderness? I preached it not too long ago. He used the Word of God to combat him. The Word keeps us from sinning. Psalm 119.11 says, Your Word I have hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. <clears throat> now I'm all for uh, kids learning the Word of God. I'm all for people memorizing scriptures that I've noticed over and over and over again that a lot of people are committing the Word of God to their head and not to their heart. And we really ought to differentiate what we really mean by committing the Word of God to our heart. When we commit the Word of God to our head, we gain knowledge. When we commit the Word of God to our heart, we by grace gain transformation. And that's what we should really be seeking the Word of God for. The Word of God says in chapter 6 and verse 33 of Matthew to seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you. The way that translates to me is God's going to take care of everything else if we would just be able to search His heart, search His mind, search Him in prayer, search the depths of Him. He'll take care of everything else. We don't have to worry about uh, how the bills are going to get paid. We don't have to worry about the clothes that will be on our back. We don't have to worry about those kinds of things. I've noticed that as I've obeyed God in the last six years, and He's taken me places and sent me things. First time I ever left this, left this country um, is because I just obeyed the Lord. I never sought to go on a vacation as wonderful as my wife and I were able to go on in this past January. I never sought that. It wasn't, wasn't even in the scope of my vision. But then the Lord opened up doors and blessed us in that way. My one rule of life is if I can completely depend upon God, I will not have to worry about anything else. It's been that way since I was saved. I can't break myself from that habit, and I'm not ever planning on doing that. <clears throat> you know, so many people are just trying to, um, they're trying to go down these paths of, of frivolous effort, just pouring so much effort trying to make their life secure in, in this day and age, and trying to secure retirement, try to make sure we have good health insurance and all this. I mean, isn't God a healer? Isn't God going to provide for us? I mean, isn't can't God supply all our needs? I mean, if we are just really upon His path and sold out to do His will, there's nothing can stand against us. And that goes directly with what we're talking about here. Question, Christians are unequipped to stand against evil apart from the Word. If we do not focus ourselves upon standing upon truth no matter what, to be guided by the Holy Spirit, knowing just exactly where we need to be and what we need to be doing, confirmed by the Word of God, and there's no power in hell to be able to talk you out of it. If you're getting called and you find it in the Word of God, there's no power in hell going to be able to stand against you. There's no power on this earth that's going to be able to talk you out of it. You experience God in such a way that His Word speaks to you and confirms your path, confirms your direction, Stay steadfast, keeps you steadfast. 
What's going to stand in your way? Nothing. Nothing ever is going to stand in your way. All the, all the powers of hell, all the influence of the world, all the influence of people's even immediate family members may try to talk you out of it, but you know beyond any shadow of a doubt God's Word has called you to this right here, and this is where I'm going. So the Word of God will keep you from sinning, will keep you on that path when the evil, the evil has, got, uh, has gotten a hold of you. But also, sinning will keep you from the Word of God. It says in Psalm 119, verse 21, You rebuke the proud, the proud, the cursed, who stray from your commandments. And that right there is just all the scripture I need to counsel anybody who says they're having a hard time uh, reading their Bible. I wouldn't say this was a, an every time occasion. Sometimes people just get distracted and busy and trying to learn disciplines. But, but I would say that most of the time people don't like to read their Bible is because they're living in outright sin and they know it. So why on earth would you want to, if rebellion is in your heart and you don't want to die out for yourself, why would you want to read a book that constantly tells you to do that? You rebuke the proud. What does it mean to be proud? It means to be going your own way. To be going your own way, doing things your own way. And the Bible explains that person is cursed. You stray from your commandments. You rebuke the proud, dash the cursed. You stray from your commandments. Whenever you do not obey the Lord, you're going to have a hard time reading the Bible. I've heard it go both ways. Maybe you should pray before you do your devotions in the morning. Before you maybe you should pray before you read the Bible in the morning. Your devotions. Maybe you should read your Bible before you pray. In the in your devotions. Either way, I think that, I don't think you should set yourself in some sort of legalistic rule of how to do devotions. I think you ought to just say, okay, Lord, I'm here this morning. Uh, you know, what do you have for me? Now, I prefer to always pray before I get into the Word of God because I understand the power of it. I understand there's a lot of depths to it. There's a lot of things I don't understand about it. And I trust that the Holy Spirit has written every word of it. So I will ask the Lord uh, just a quick prayer usually. Would you please open up my eyes, open up my heart, open up my mind. I don't always pray it the same way, just in a general way. Lord, help me read your Bible this morning. He's always been faithful to do that. And He always will be. And then if the Word says something that I need to repent of or I need to, I need to get cleaned up in my life, I'm always willing to be able to do that. And I'm so thankful that His Word so unsearchable it is. I've read the New Testament itself several times. I always find something new in there every time I read it to grab a hold of my heart and get me a little bit deeper. I'm thankful for that. If you got sin in your life, you're not going to want to read the Word. To summarize all that, the Word of God keeps us from sinning. And sinning keeps us from the Word of God. It's just a little bit expansion upon that phrase. Isaiah 59 verse 2 says... <clears throat> But if your iniquities have separated you from your God and your sins have hidden His face from you, so that He uh, so that He will not hear. But your iniquities have separated you from your God and your sins have hidden His face from you, so that He will not hear. And so, you've got rebellion in your life. It would make sense why your devotions are, are so hard to do, so hard to read. You're, if you're plainly rejecting God's call in your life, you're plainly rejecting what God has wanted you to do, commanded you to do, then yeah, the Word of God's not going to be something you'll want to be in every day. But see, it goes back to that truth versus feelings thing. That's the hardest feelings. Uh, when you don't feel like doing something, that's the hardest thing to stop so for some, some reason. And uh, so you just have to stamp those feelings out and say, you know, there's a reason why I don't like reading the Word of God. There's a reason why I don't like doing devotions. Um, and what is it? I mean, if it's spiritual warfare, the Lord's faithful to show you that. If it's rebellion in your life, then the Lord will give you an opportunity by grace to clean it right up. And finally, Christians are not convicted of further needs apart from the Word of God. See, Scripture judges the heart. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. What scripture will really read you? Moment. 
It'll really show you further growth comes from reading the Word of God. And it says, um, and, and if that's true, if we, you know, if the Word of God were proof, it corrects you. Uh, you know, praise the Lord. That's there's no better way than correct somebody in their path than just showing them the Scripture. That way they don't get mad at you. They're getting mad at God. God's big enough to handle it, and He can convict them of that too. <laughs> no better way. There's no better way. You know, a rebuke in and of itself. I walk up and say, you know, God, uh, you know, you know, friend, God doesn't like the filthy language. Well, that comes off as me just being judgmental and critical. If I said, you know, friend, Colossians 3 8 says, let no filthy thing come out of your mouth. Let no filthy language come out of your mouth. You shouldn't do that. And they, then all of a sudden your rebuke has authority. Because the word of God has authority. <clears throat> so if you open up the word of God and it judges your heart, it shows you something you need to clean up, don't get discouraged. Grab a hold of faith. Go on through, man. Christianity is not about being defeated all the time because you don't feel like you've gotten where you need to be. It's every time you read the Word of God, hopefully, just about every time, every couple of days when you open up the book, you'll realize, hey, I'm still not where I need to be. I'm thankful, I'm thankful that I am where God has put me, but I'm not where I need to be. Don't turn, don't turn around and say, oh man, this begrudging thing, I swear, I just don't even know. I'd what where to go next and what to do next. It seems like every time I open up the Bible, it's just just tear me apart again. Well, just praise God for that because He's making you more like Jesus. That's what it's all about. Um, <clears throat> he's putting you through that refiner's fire so when you get to heaven, you'll be able to stand up there in confidence. So if you've done all you can to stand, you can stand before Him and say, man, I live the victory because by faith, everything that you showed me, I've got it under the blood and I'm ready to go on through. Like how Psalm 119, 9 and 11 says, how can a young man cleanse his way by taking heed according to your word? You've got to take heed according to it. Don't read the book flippantly. Go there expecting God to say something to you. Go there and take heed to it. Go there and say, man, this has got something for me in it today. And I want to know what the Lord has to say to me today. With my whole, with my whole heart, I have sought you. <clears throat> See, that's God honors us when we go to Him with our whole heart. With our whole heart. And you know, you can have flaws in your life and still be after God with your whole heart. That's the thing God's worried about. He's worried about our... He's, he's, well, God's not worried about anything. If He was worried, He'd be worried about our fervor after Him, our hunger for Him. With my whole heart I've sought you. Oh, let me not wander from your commandments. Your word I have hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. Oh, what a wonderful passage that is in context. If the word of God says it, you're already convicted. You understand that, don't you? You understand that <clears throat> conviction is not a feeling. You understand that conviction is not an emotion. You understand that conviction is not something that you have to wait on. I heard a person say to me one time, um, I don't feel like I need to put down cigarettes because, you know, I'm just not convicted about that. He said, well, you know, it's a... In your body being a temple of the Holy Spirit that you're supposed to be taken care of, being a good steward of, isn't that a problem? You know, isn't that a problem? I put down for the for the most part, I've had a soda, one soda in the last week or so, just because, just for no other reason, because I realized I was destroying God's temple drinking pop. And I told my wife, I said, you know, I like cherry coke and I like these these dark sodas you're bringing into the house, I appreciate it. You just don't bring any more to me. I just don't want to drink them anymore. Bring Mountain Dew all you want. I don't really like that stuff. If you do, you can drink it all you want to. I wouldn't touch that. You know, I, I got enough self-control to be able to handle that. And there's a soda, cold cherry Coke sitting there in the fridge. As bad as I know it is for me coming in after a hot day, I just want to drink that thing down. Knowing all the medical problems it would cause me. Knowing that I'm predisposed to diabetes. And knowing that I've already shown signs of being pre-diabetic. I'd sit there and... Drink that pop down. And by the way, you know when you drink soda, it dehydrates you. It automatically dehydrates you. you don't, you're not even getting any. It's not, nothing good for it, in, in, like at all. And I was talking to a doctor about it last night, and she said the same thing. Uh, she's a holistic doctor here. She said, you know, I quit buying pop because simply because it, it hurt. You know, it just absolutely hurt. Me. You know, it it was hurting my body, and I was paying for my body, to hurt. and that's really what it was. So God convicted me of that. Did I have any feelings? Did I have any emotions to go along with it? No, it was just true. 
you know, when I drink this stuff, it makes my cyber. That's a pretty good sign that you're like predisposed to diabetes and stuff. So that's reason enough for me to just put it down. I'm not going to do it anymore. Whenever I go a whole day without drinking a bunch of sugar, I, I start getting weak. Good enough reason to put it down. You know, no emotion connected anyway. Part of my personal experience here, one point I'm trying to get across is conviction is not a feeling, my friend. Conviction is not a feeling whatsoever. Conviction is truth. If the Word of God points out some sin in your life and you're not convicted of it, you have a heart that is cold toward God's Word. And that's a scary place to be. And a lot of people will say things, especially with the gray area sins I've seen before for a record trail and my whole soda experience in the last week. <laughs> that <clears throat> well, I'm just not convicted that way. I'm not convicted that sex before marriage is a bad thing. Somebody said the other day. It's pretty clear that those people are not here at the kingdom of God. A lot of people going around today saying, I'm not convicted that homosexuality is really a bad thing. In other words, they don't have feelings and emotions attached to it. Well, the Word of God says it is a bad thing. So it is a bad thing. Matter of fact, it's a sinful thing that will send people to hell. There's people who will say that <clears throat> they're not convicted about many things. And what they're really saying there is like, I don't feel like that's wrong. Well, it doesn't matter if you feel like it's wrong. Let me just show you how, just for a second, if you'll allow me, how the court system works. <clears throat> Whenever you're charged with a crime, that crime is stated in a list of statutes by the state that says, this right here outlines what a crime is. Trafficking in the first degree would be dealing drugs on the interstate in between two states, for instance. You know why we know that it's dealing drugs between two states? Because trafficking in the first degree is outlined by federal law in a book. Okay? You see how that works? <clears throat> what happens to a convicted sex offender? They go on to a national registry. Why is that? Why do we know that that's going to what outlines what sex offenses are? Because it's written down in a book. And see whether they feel like they've done wrong or not. They're still convicted because the book says it. So we really got to redefine what conviction actually is. Conviction sometimes can be blessed with a feeling that we know that it's true and we have to. And God can bless us that way. But if we would just really open up the Word of God and say, you know, if the Word of God says it, and I'm not doing it, I'm already guilty. I'm already convicted. That's what true conviction is all about. The Word of God says it. Doesn't matter if I believe it or not. Doesn't matter if I feel like that's true or not. Doesn't matter if I feel like, you know, that I'm I'm remorseful over it. And man, if you're not remorseful over something God has called sin, you've got much bigger problems than a feeling of conviction. Much bigger problems. <clears throat> so if the Word of God says it. We are convicted. And see, Christians are not convicted of their further needs apart from being deep through the Scriptures. You will not know how deep you need to go unless you constantly insist on studying through the Word of God. So in conclusion, we just say, without the Word of God, you will perish. But if you stay near to God's Word, you will prosper spiritually into a mighty vessel for God's use. I mean, that's a promise. I can promise you that from this pulpit. If you sit and discover the depths of God's Word in a mighty way, and just, just say, you know, this week I am selling myself whatever your Word has to say to me. I'm going to do it. You just settle your life that way, and it's a rule of life. And the only thing that keeps us from doing that is our selfish desires, our, our self autonomy. Our control over our own personal life. When we lose control of our own personal life, we just say, you know what? If the Word of God says this, I'm going to abide by it. I'm going to do it. And then if it's something you're confused about, you've also got access to the throne through prayer where God will definitely lay on your heart the direction, the course in which you should follow. And then He leaves it up to you whether or not you want to follow it or not. If you do follow it, you're going to have peace. If you don't follow it, you're not. 
Because there's no such thing as a Christian that does not have peace in their heart if they're walking in the whole will of God. That's just how it works. It's peace He lives with us, right? So, if you like peace in your life this morning, you're welcome to come up and pray. But also, you maybe notice these little things that we've got across the altar, which usually means in this church a different kind of altar call. Um, what I'd like to do this week, <clears throat> and I'll mention this tonight too, there are night visitors. These little things, I'm calling the JCC Week Long Bible Challenge. You guys want to do a Bible challenge this week? I think it'd be a good thing for us to do this. You know, sometimes we just have to construct good habits, so this is my way of just saying, here's a good thing you can do. <clears throat> so this week's Bible challenge is going to be reading through the whole book of Romans. If you really want to go the extra mile, you can do it twice. Here's what I'm going to require of you. Is I've got a checklist here. Monday, read chapter 1. Tuesday, read chapters 2 and 3. Wednesday, read chapters 4 and 5. Thursday, read chapters 6 and 8. Friday, 9 through 11. Saturday, 12 through 16. By the time you come back in here Sunday morning, you would have read through the whole book of Romans in in about in six days. You're really easy to do, really. And if you really wanted to go the extra mile, you can sit down and read it as it's supposed to be read, as any letter is supposed to be read. Read all the book of Romans in one sitting on top of the daily routine. I would suggest everybody do that. Just sit down and read the whole book of Romans in one sitting. You can do that this afternoon. It takes right around about an hour and a half, maybe. And you get the whole scope of it. You understand it in its fullest context. You get the whole scope of the book of Romans. So if you'd like to do that, we're going to sing 435 here. Faith has found a resting place. If you'd like.